Hello, everybody. Welcome to Krakow in the Capitol. If you haven't been welcomed, that is what I'm here to do. My name is Emily Anderson, and I work in the Office of Youth Ministry for the Archdiocese of Washington. So we're very excited to have you here. Um, and I get the tremendous privilege of introducing our speakers today. But first, uh, we're going to begin in prayer, like we should all things in our lives. And we're actually going to pray the Archdiocese of Washington's Year of Mercy prayer. So if you've prayed this and you know it, feel free to join in, but if you don't, that's okay too. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God and Father, you have created all things and know the desire of every heart. In this year of mercy, we reflect on your great love for us and acknowledge our sinfulness and need for your healing mercy. Trusting that you ever ti- that you never tire of forgiving us, we open our hearts to receive your forgiveness and love. Having encountered you, mercy itself, and guided by the Holy Spirit, may we witness to the love we have received by sharing it with those most in need, the hungry, the homeless, the afflicted, and the oppressed. We ask this through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So our session today is Where Do I Belong? How to Find and Form a Community as Young Adults. If you're in the wrong session, that's the one that we're at right now. So uh, no hard feelings if you're totally in the wrong one and you need to get up. Um, And we have three great speakers today on our panel, and so I get the privilege of introducing them. Um, The Most Reverend Dennis J. Madden is the Auxiliary Bishop for the Archdiocese of Baltimore, a position which he has held since 2005. Bishop Madden has served as Associate Secretary General of the Catholic Near East Welfare Association and is the Director of the Pontifical Mission for Palestine Office in Jerusalem. He was one of the co-founders of the Accord Foundation, a humanitarian organization that has worked since 1988 in the West Bank and Gaza. He holds a master's degree in psychology from Columbia University in New York and a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Notre Dame. Dr. Susan Timoney is the Secretary for Pastoral Ministry and Social Concerns for the Archdiocese of Washington. She's the first woman appointed to this position, and she oversees the office that assists parishes in carrying out the new evangelization. Dr. Timoney earned her doctorate in sacred theology at the University of St. Thomas Aquinas, Rome, and is an adjunct professor here at Catholic University of America. Dr. Timoney lectures widely on issues related to evangelization, Catholic spirituality, lay vocation, and mission. She and her husband live in Washington, D.C. And finally, we have um, Mr. Ron Rodriguez with us. He was born and raised in Puerto Rico, And when he was 22 years old, he won a battle against cancer and in 2007 had a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus that completely altered his course in life. In 2013, he took a sabbatical from his career as a NASA engineer to travel the world for a year and experience life with several Christian communities. After his return, he had a desire to explore a more intentional life in Christian community and is currently living in a household with three other young adult males under a rule of life and is a founding member of the Christ Life Missionary Community. Let's give a hand to our speakers. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So I want to give you a little idea of how the um, next hour is going to go. Our topic is community. We're going to try to look at community in all the various forms that we have an opportunity to form community, first as missionary disciples and second as Catholics. And each of us is going to spend about 10 minutes or so reflecting, and then we want to be able to open it up to questions and conversation. So I do a lot of teaching in this building, and so if there isn't a number of questions or conversation, I'll feel the need to give a quiz. So I'd like you to prepare to listen with an ear to be able to join our conversation on community. The other thing I want to say is this panel is such a delightful um, indication of the way in which we think about what it means to be Catholics, right? That we have bishop and laity thinking together and thinking about the responsibility we have to build the kingdom of God. And so with that, I'd like to um, hand over the microphone to Bishop Madden. Thanks very much, Susan. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's great to see you all. Just take a few minutes to speak about some of my background and 
how that fits into our discussion of community. And then I hope we have a nice time to discuss this together and try to field some questions. I originally, before becoming a diocesan priest, I was a Benedictine. So there's community right from the very, very start. I belong to a small monastery up in Newton, New Jersey. And uh, I never left that life. The, uh, the, the monastery left me. Uh, the, the monastery closed up. The, uh, when I went there first, there was about 65 monks. And then in the end, it turned out there were just about three, and two of them were retired abbots. So uh, I then became a priest of the Archdiocese of Baltimore. In Baltimore now, I serve as the auxiliary bishop for Baltimore. I have about 95 churches that I, I oversee in Baltimore City, Baltimore County, and Harford County. Before, when I was getting, working on my degree at Notre Dame, I, I lived in a hall, alumni hall, and that also was another experience of community. And it was a wonderful hall. There were about 250 young men. And we formed a very, very good community there. Prayer community, study community, work community. It was just a very, very good experience. Just recently, I went with uh, CRS, Catholic Relief Services, and we visited the, um, the refugee centers in Serbia, Lebanon, and Greece that CRS funds, and that are really operated by Caritas, the Caritas organizations in each country. I was very, very impressed with what I saw there. And again, so many young people, just about your age, same age as you, working in these these God-awful situations. There, there are thousands and thousands of refugees fleeing from mostly Syria and Iraq, but also Afghanistan and Iran and Pakistan as well. But the majority came from Syria and Iraq. These people had fled and come over the uh, Mediterranean. The last year, over 3,000 people have drowned there trying to reach some safe haven. In each of these refugee centers, there were young people working for Caritas and for CRS, helping these people in every way possible. Many of them had health needs. Many of them had broken bones. They were beaten by the police or the soldiers as they were trying to go into different countries. All of them were in great need in one way or another. One of the things that impressed me most was how the aid workers from CRS and Caritas were able themselves to form communities. And as a result of that, they helped the refugees themselves form communities. Despite all that they had suffered and all they had gone through, in trying to reach a safe haven, they, they still maintained their sense of humanity. You would see them, there's a refugee, so I mean, they're kicking soccer balls out in the field, praying, uh, being together, telling a lot of stories, laughing, and spending time with them. We would often eat with the, uh, the refugees and eat with the staff as well. Just one one's very very small thing, but it touched my heart deeply. One day, one evening, we were having a meal, and we were talking and so on, going back and forth. And I, I went to reach for the bowl to take some food for myself. And I found the bowl was empty. And the young man sitting next to me, he, he tapped me on my arm and he just pointed to my plate. He had put the food in my plate before he took it for himself. And I was just touched by that. I mean, I think that um, these are people who had been starving, uh, had health issues. And they still were able to do these things for each other, really help each other and help someone else, who obviously I was in no dire need for food that day, so it was something that touched me very deeply. Last year in Baltimore, as you may know, we had some riots there, and those were very difficult times. Those followed the death of Freddie Gray. Freddie Gray, as you may know or may not know, was someone who was arrested, and while he was in custody, he died. The trials that went on have really, no one was found guilty, or no one, no, no one was found guilty in any of the trials that they had, and they decided not to go, to go through with the two f- trials that were still left. But what we found out during that time is that in that area where he lived, the unemployment rate was something like 47%, 47%. The educational system was totally lacking. The housing was sub-substandard. And there was no, no way for these people to get the adequate health care that they needed. This was the environment within which they were, these people were living. As a result of that, 
a number of the young adult communities from around Baltimore, and Archbishop Laurie has done a whole lot of work in this area, have tried to attack, attack each one of these areas. We're doing it as, a, as an archdiocese and also with our different ecumenical and interreligious partners. But in each of these instances, what has proved to be the most powerful tool is when not only the people, the young adults, are working and doing some good work there, but when they get the community involved. And the commu- that is what makes a project a success. I lived for about nine years in the Holy Land, and there I worked with refugees, Palestinian refugees this time. And there the young Palestinians and the young Israelis form, we formed this group called Accord. And we decided we would work together on projects that we could all support, health, education, water, these kinds of things. And it was amazing that you always hear in the news about all the strife going on between Israelis and Palestinians. And that's true. There is a lot going on. But there's a lot more going on at the community level where people give up these, these uh, problems that they faced over the years and they decide to work together. It's wonderful things that communities can do if you pull together. And it's really not beyond our reach at all, something well within our reach. Just to finish up with a word or two about our young adult groups in the parishes around Baltimore, I serve as the uh, interim rector at the, uh, at the Basilica downtown, and it's, uh, it's a wonderful thing. We're forming some young adult communities around there, and a lot of this comes actually from the young adults themselves. They look around, they look for a place where there are young adult communities, and if they aren't there, they try to form them themselves. We have a church right nearby us, and uh, there was a church at uh, St. Casimir's, and they used to have about, I guess, about 25 or 30 young adults who would go to that church. But then a few of them got together, and they said, you know, we really would like to have our own mass from time to time. We'd like to have our own projects we could engage in from time to time. We'd like to pray together in addition to going to church on Sunday. We'd like to do a lot of different things. And they formed a community. Now that community probably has about 150 up to 200 young adults going to the services that they have there. The uh, Dominican Fathers at St. Philip and James have been doing a wonderful, wonderful work on the, with their community. The Jesuits down at St. Ignatius, they also have a powerful community there, which does wonderful, wonderful work. Very, 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 very active there. And that's been going on for a while. Those are some of the things I just want to sort of put out there, hopefully sowing some seeds for some discussion later on. The one thing that I would just want to leave you with is the, the power that is in a community, the power when it comes up from the community as opposed to when it's something that's kind of imposed. Or it's, There's a big difference by saying we have a, a group here you might be interested in joining as opposed to we want to form a group. So I hope that we'll have some discussion about these things. Thanks so very much. Thank you very much, Bishop Madden. Uh, my name is Juan. Uh, how are you all doing? Doing good? Uh, first thing I wanted to say is that I really want to thank you very much for what you're doing, like just showing up for this event. <laughs> I'm not talking about just showing up for my talk, but just overall, okay? Um, because World Youth Day, I was at World Youth Day in Brazil uh, three years ago. Anyone here was there? Raise your hands. Got one person. <laughs> That's about it. One person, two. And I was there, and I was just completely amazed at the witness of the Catholicity of the church. That means the universal aspect of the church, which a church that knows no divisions or boundaries, because you had people coming from Africa, from Asia, from South America, North America, Europe. I didn't see anyone from Antarctica, but uh, they were all holding up their flags. They, even though sometimes they were like language barriers, people would still like get together. They would share gifts. They would meet one another and just share that, that universal language of love and understanding that we can have with one another, even when we cannot necessarily speak for a long time or understand each other well with words. So the fact that you're here, it's a witness to that solidarity with them in Poland. I know you probably would have liked to be in Poland, me too, but it's, it's really powerful because it's, it's not just about being in Poland, it's really 
about the entire world and, and Jesus' plan for, for the world. So thank you for that. Um, I wanted to talk first to the, the, the point that uh, Bishop Madden was talking. He said that how powerful it is, how instead of like imposing, okay, you guys start this, when something like kind of comes up from the bottom, from the people, they say they want to join this. Because I'm part of a group called Christ Life Young Adults. And we started in 2009. Um, basically, there's this apostle that called Christ Life. They had this seven-week course called Discovering Christ. Have any of you ever heard of it in your parish, Discovering Christ? I have a few people there. And they did a, a film session because back, back then, they would only do the talks but live, but they wanted to make DVDs so that they could share it all across the nation. So they did this course, Discovering Christ. It was a film session, and it was for young adults. And we went there. I, I only was able to make it to two sessions, but even with that, at the end, I was like, wow, this is, this is so cool. We cannot let it end now. And, and I wasn't the only one. There were several people who said, like, this has to go on some way, somehow. And then out of that desire in our hearts to, to fellowship, to, to get to know the Lord better and, and to serve him, we started meeting once a week. We didn't know what to do. You know, we didn't have a priest telling us what to do or, or someone else directing us. We just wanted to get together and praise the Lord and learn and see what, what he was, had in store. And Christ Every Young Adults has grown significantly. Hundreds of young adults have come through the doors uh, to our gatherings. We meet on Wednesday nights at Saint, uh, the Anthony, uh, Shrine of St. Anthony in Ellicott City. And right now we have like a, a, a yearly retreat. We have prison ministry, w- women's group, men's group. We have um, mission in Haiti. A few of us are in Poland. So it has like grown. And it, it really just want to share that because for me, it, it really changed my life because before I was kind of trying to do Christianity on my own. I don't know. Any of you guys ever tried that? <laughs> Does it work? <laughs> so it's, for me, it was a real blessing. And so that happened in 2009. And, but I, I still had my career as, a, as an engineer at NASA. And I was a very... Um, involved in dancing a lot so I danced four to five times a week I taught dancing that was my main hobby and 2010 I I bought a house so I'm like you know I'm making good money I have my social life I have this house that I just remodeled and I'm so excited about it and then you know I have the group of young adults so when I feel like I need a little spiritual like jolt then I can go go there so I was divided across all this and I I thought I I was all set and I remember remember one day I had my housewarming party and I had like many people come over and and then the party ended it was great everybody left and I remember the moment that that last person left I just felt like a deep loneliness that I could not explain I'm like was that it and I struggled with that why why after having such a successful party do I have this longing, this ache, this loneliness, and it just feeling that, just, that it doesn't satisfy. So um, I continue to pursue um, really what Jesus said, because in John chapter 10, he made a promise. He said, I have come that you may have life, life in all its fullness. And I feel like I wasn't quite fully at there. I felt like I just had highs and lows and everything else in the middle. And I had this um, dream that got planted in my, in my life to actually um, take a sabbatical from work and go a year and travel around the world. Now, that's pretty, uh, I mean, that's pretty wild. I, I'm not sure how to do that. How do you go? What do you pack? Where do you go? What do you do? Um, how do I tell my mom and dad that I'm going to be out for a year? <laughs> well, wait a minute. My employer expects me to show up to work? What? So it's actually quite a miracle that they, when I told my boss, he actually allowed me to do this. I, although I think it had something to do that I told him, asked him in the middle of December. So it's like Christmas season, everyone's like happy and, you know, <laughs> relaxed. And I'm like, hey, can I take some year off? Sure. It's happy, Merry Christmas. <laughs> so I took off 2013, April, and I started alone. I started alone. I started walking a pilgrimage from Lourdes, France, um, 
all the way to the northwest tip of Spain in something called the Camino de Santiago or the Way of St. James. Thank you very much. Um, so I walked for 40 days, 600 miles. And it was a very powerful initiation experience for what would continue to follow through um, the rest of the year. Because one thing that happened just before I left, I remember the last time I was at the Christ Life Young Adult Group, I knelt before the Eucharist and I was just praying. And then I, I began to weep and weep and weep because I felt like, oh my God, I can't believe that in a few weeks I'm leaving and I'm going to be alone, and I'm f- afraid because I wasn't able to do, follow my faith when I tried to do it alone, and I'm, I'm really going to be alone in a place where I know no one, no family, no friends. How am I even going to be able to, to sustain my life? Will I just give in to the world? So I had this fear that I was just going to give in to the world, that I would just, just kind of lose myself, and even questioning whether it was from God that I should go on my own to travel the world. But I did, and one thing that um, I noticed in the Camino was the restlessness. You would meet a lot of people for a time, and you, you see people yearning for a place of belonging, a place of wanting to be understood. And it, it, there's a beautiful thing. There's some magic in that pilgrimage because everyone is kind of on a level playing field. Everyone's walking. Everyone's just going to the same destination. So you, you're struggling with the same thing. So that brings people together in a very beautiful way. And I, I think that's why it's so important that we not just try to share life, you know, we just, oh, we're so nice, we're here together, but really strive towards a goal. And, and the, the Camino had a goal, and our life has a goal, and that goal is in heaven. And, you know, we should be filled with hope and desire for, for what God has in store for us in heaven and his command to build his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. So we have a goal, and, 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 and to share that in the, in the Camino really brought us together. Um, a lot of different pilgrims, you would understand. And then after that, um, I remember I went to Morocco. Eventually, I made my way, way to World Youth Day in Brazil, alone, <laughs> which was odd. <laughs> Everyone goes in groups uh, to World Youth Day. All the pilgrims are different groups, parish groups, community groups, and I'm like the only guy who's alone. And people are like, wow, you're very courageous <laughs> doing this. And... Yeah, you know, I didn't know any Portuguese also, so that was kind of hard at first. And one, one thing happened that was quite interesting. Um, like halfway through World Youth Day, they had this place where they had different communities were like kind of talking about who they are and what they're doing. And I met a community from Brazil called Eucaristos. And I remember just being interested. And they said, hey, why don't you just come visit us? afterwards and and stay with us after you're done with World Youth Day and I I didn't have a plane ticket back you know so I was like sure I'll go (laughs) and I stayed with them two weeks this is a new community and and something quite remarkable happened because I had traveling all along but when I was with this community all of a sudden I could have the ordinary things of life but in an extraordinary um, setting and that just like really, that's the place where I feel like, wow, this is why I travel. I wanted to experience the ordinary things in extraordinary settings. Just to be able to have like a group of people who I felt was friends and just go out or share something and, and surf. And it was really, it really lifted me up. And I was really encouraged by, by how, how the young people there, because these new communities are, are mostly young people who gather together, who are willing to lay down their lives for, for God and to serve. And, 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 and the beautiful thing is how they just attract so many people. And here's the thing. Christian community is attractive. If we really live out to the point that we say, you know, I have my individual personal preferences, but I'm willing, willing to bend them for the sake of, of the, a, a greater good, for the sake of community. And when people see that harmony, that being of one mind, one heart, one soul— putting on the mind of Christ, when people see that, they, people resonate with that. They're drawn to that. I was drawn to that. I was really impressed by the simplicity of life that they chose and not really being attached or having too many things, which has a really nice consequence because I think when we have too much stuff, we worry too much. We're concerned about things, how to put things here, put things there, buy this next thing, throw this thing away. But when we do away with all that, all of a sudden we become available for people. 
So the people there were available for me, and they had a hospitality that was beyond that, hey, have a cookie. No, they're like, here, let me share life with you. Let me get to know you. Let me talk to you about this, our community. Let me take you with me to where I work. And, and just being able to do that in a foreign country was really um, enriching experience that, that led me to think, I want that. I want, when I come back, I want to have that kind of experience of community here. And, and that really started the fire. And I, I did that f- for about three months. So a three-week trip in Brazil turned into three months. And the hospitality was so great. The whole three months, even though I went to 12 different cities, I never had to pay for accommodations. Half the time, I didn't have to pay for food. It was like God was just taking care of me, placing me here, taking me there, even taking me to a mission in the Amazon with three days' notice. Like, <laughs> like I just get to this community that I just met, and they like, they tell me they're going to the Amazon. I'm like, wow, that's so interesting. And then they ask, oh, do you want to come? Like, sure, when you're heading. And three days. Oh, and how do I get there? Oh, you need to get a plane ticket. And how am I going to get a plane ticket three days in advance in an affordable way all the way to the Amazon? Well, it wasn't affordable. It was very expensive. But then the next morning I remembered, oh, I have miles. Let me see how that goes. And with miles, I only had to pay like $20 or something. And I was like two days later taking a 20-hour boat ride deep into the Amazon for a mission to evangelize. And, and they were really trusting and of a man, who, a young adult who had no reference. I had no one who knew me. I just showed up. I just showed up. And then they had me, okay, now it's your turn. Go preach <laughs> in Portuguese. And I preached, and I visited people, and I proclaimed the gospel, and God showed up, and we, it was just it was mind-blowing experience um, that really reshaped um, my life. So that's really part of, of the world travel. There's so much more, such a diversity of communities, there, but eventually I made my way back, and I had this desire. I want to have that kind of life. And within six months, the Christ Life Missionary Community started to emerge. So remember this group, the Christ Life Young Adults, I talked about that formed in 2009. Well, a few of us who had been there for a long time, we we kept having this desire for something more, more intentional, committed uh, life of mission and community. So. That's something that started last year. And actually, on the feast day of St. Benedict <laughs> is when we had our first Mass and we started gathering. And, and it's, like um, Bishop was saying, something that started from within. From within the heart of what was going on, we said, like, we want more. And we know God wants more. And we just pursued that. Um, another thing that, that happened recently, since last September, I started living with three other young adult men from the Christ of Young Adults. And... Um, we started living under a rule of life that, um, that I wrote up. And the, the reason for the rule of life is because one thing that I learned is that there's a big difference between being committed to live intentionally and having good intentions. Big difference. And I did not want to live my life in community having good intentions. I wanted to make a commitment to living intentionally. And what a rule of life is, is a set of guidelines that stays this is the way of life that we have chosen. And this is what, how we want to live so that we can better uh, grow in love for one another, in holiness as brothers, and also to serve others. So the three pillars of our rule of life is a, frater- uh, a shared prayer life. So we got we to gotta talk with God, you know, if we want to get this uh, life thing right. So a shared fraternal life, a shared, uh, a shared prayer life, a shared fraternal life and also a shared service life, which comes mainly through hospitality. So our house is available um, to the community for events. Once a month, we have like a praise and worship gathering in a home. It's really, really intimate, really powerful. And one thing about fraternal life, I think it's important. One thing I did not experience fully when I was traveling was what happens when people get to know each other for a long time. What happens? Someone said fight? Yes, people fight, people get annoyed, people get irritated. But I, when I was traveling, I was seeing a Christian witness of community. But before it got time for people to start like rubbing, you know, things, um, you know, conflicts, I was already moving on to the next city or whatever. So I kind of, I was just in for like the, the initial parts, which is really like joyful. And like when you meet a person, you, you're always nice. The other person's always nice. 
get to know them a few months and you know, things might change. Um, so we, have, we, we know that this happens. So one of the aspects of our rule of life is that, we, and this is based on what I learned from one of the communities there, is one of the principles of one of the communities I visited is to live reconciled with one another to the point that this community in Brazil when they have problem with finances, like they're not getting enough donations or they're just like struggling, the founder, he goes to, to their member and says, okay, people here are not getting along. You need to reconcile one another because God is the one who provides. And the founder believes that God not, may not be providing because you're bickering with people or you're being annoyed or resentful. So he encourages all of the community members to be to really strive to become reconciled, to find what resentment they may be holding and just, just let the Lord heal that. And then they, you know, they trust that God will provide whatever, whatever it means. So one thing that we start in, in our household is that every Sunday morning after we go to Mass together, we have what we call recon and renew. Because we're men. We cannot say reconciliation. That's kind of sentimental. Recon and renew we can do. So we, we go to Mass we have recon. Recon means we have a time where we all gather and we share, hey, this is what annoyed me this week. Or, hey, I kind of was a jerk this past Tuesday when I was cooking and I know I was, you know, just a time for forgiveness and healing. And we've been living together for, for a year now. And I'm just amazed at the fact that there has not been a single, like, conflict that has blown out of proportion. And we just got into the habit of always forbearing one another, forgiving one another, and this just weekly practice has really been worked wonder. So community, I think that's, that's all I want to share. I've been talking for a long time, so thank you. Thanks, Juan. So the third piece of community that we want to talk about is the opportunity to build community among young adults at the parish. We know that in Krakow and even here today, we're having this experience of the community that binds us as a universal church, that the beauty of being Catholic is that we are one church that's lived out in the local churches of the diocese that we come from. And then that local church is lived out, right? We talk about the parish um, is the church embedded in our neighborhoods. And so I want to talk a little bit about um, the joy of discovering a parish that can be your spiritual home and discovering the parish that, can, that you can feel rooted in the church because of your participation in the parish. And for me, I'll have to say, this has always been the lifeblood of my relationship with the Lord. I was blessed with a great campus ministry program when I was in college. Following college, I was a Jesuit volunteer, and I went to rural Alaska. And the first week that I was there, well, first of all, we got to our house, which had no running water, and so they said, so here's how um, the bathroom works. There's, there's a, a toilet, and you can use that. And then once a week, you take the bottom part of it, and you take it over to the sewer, and you dump it at the sewage plant. And I was like, you can't be serious. I'm going to, okay, got it? That This is missionary opportunity. And then the next night, a group of um, uh, Indians came to welcome us, and they handed us this huge lump of red, bloody, hairy moose. And they said, we wanted to share our first moose of the season with you. A huge smile. Thank you so much. And I'm looking at it thinking, wow, a lot goes on from meat to when you get to the supermarket, and it's in that nice plastic package. And by the time I got to Mass on Sunday morning, it was like, thanks be to God, Mass is Mass. Like, I know what a parish is like. I can feel at home here. And the beauty was I could feel at home in that Mass with these Athabascan Indian villagers, and I could sign up to lecture, and I could sign up to get involved because that's what I knew built community. To me, that was my spiritual home. And from there, I could go out and become part of of the larger community. And I'm happy to say, came in first in the white person's division of the sled dog race. Thank you very much by the end of my time there. <laughs> so parish was always something I looked to. And so what I'd like to talk a little bit about is how do you begin to build that parish community a young, among young adults if there isn't already one? 
And the first thing I want to say is, you're not the church of tomorrow, you are the church of today. And you belong in your parish community the moment that you're baptized. And so we, as parishes, need to be better at recognizing that we're not waiting until you're married and have little kids to say, well, now you're part of parish life. So we're trying to help our pastoral teams be more sensitive to this. But when I came to Washington, D.C. 17 years ago and went to the parish, um, St. Peter's on Capitol Hill, there was not a young adult group, but a few of us who were at Mass together just decided we'd go out for breakfast together. And we'd meet at Mass, and we'd go for breakfast. And that began the building of a community that eventually has led to a terrific, 15 years later, great young adult presence. But to begin by just reaching out and saying, where are the other young adults and how would I like to spend time with them? And then both as Bishop Madden and Juan has said, what is it that you need from one another and ask one another to begin to do that? And so I want to charge you with not waiting so much until you may see something in the bulletin that says, hey, we're starting a young adult ministry. Because it's not going to happen until a couple of young adults go to the pastor and say, can you help us start a group? Can you help us reach out and find other young adults and what they might want to do? But what are the benefits of really rooting yourself in a parish and making it a spiritual home? I think the first benefit is you feel grounded, that you begin to see and pray with the people who you see in the grocery store or who you see in the gym or who you see in your apartment building. So one is you can begin to feel like you're part of the larger community that surrounds the parish. The second one is, it has been such a source for me of cross-generational relationships that you can become friends with the 70-plus-year-old women, you know, who decorate the church every Christmas and are looking for help. And you can become maybe, a, um, you know, work at the Bible camp or serve as a catechist and get to know some of the kids in the parish and watch them grow up. Or you can, you can begin to form relationships with people who you would never imagine could be friends. A young adult woman told me last Lent she wanted to join a Bible study in her parish, and she thought, I don't want to do the young adult Bible study. I want to get to know some of the other parishioners. And she didn't work on Wednesdays, and there was a group that met on Wednesdays. So she called the coordinator of the group, and she said, I'd love to join the Wednesday Bible study. And the woman said, this is great. It's going to be at my home. And she goes to the home, and she knocks on the door, And a woman opens a door who she said was easily 85, you know, maybe even 100. And they just looked at each other and took a deep breath. And she's like, well, come on in. (laughs) And so there was no one there, as you might imagine, under the age of 70. But she said it was the best six weeks of her life. And she left not only with a better understanding of scripture, but with five new grandmoms who were all about wanting to be her friend. And she said, you know, she realized it was a both end. She needs her young adults, but it told her there was so much to be gained by getting to know other parishioners. And so I say, sign up and surprise the heck out of that scripture study group. But take the chance to find a parish where you think you're feeling at home and begin to make that your spiritual home because the church needs you and we need your gifts and our parishes need you to be the church of today. Okay, it is time for questions, for comments. Emily's going to channel her inner Oprah and bring the microphone around, but I might be able to stand. Um, Just for you, um, Dr. Susan, uh, what you just said about um, your, your parish, but if you don't have a parish, if you're just visiting a place, or if you're in college and you're, you, know, right. you don't have a place in that way, um, what do you suggest for that? You know, that's a, that's a really great suggestion because there's a lot of moving around at this stage in life, right? And so I would say two things. Always start with the parish that's closest to where you live and give it a try, right? Go a couple of Sundays, see what's going on, see if it's something that fits. Call your diocesan young adult ministry office because inevitably they would have a list of the parishes that have, you know, going young adult groups And that might be an easy way to start as well. Or to ask some of the young adults who you work with um, uh, where where they go to church and what they like about it. Um, So those are three suggestions I have. Anyone want to add? Yes. I was out in the Herndon Reston area, and there was a 2030 single Bible study for 
on the silver line. And so I went there, met them, and I've been a part of their Bible study ever since. So I found it that way. (laughs) Meetup.com. Hi. Yeah. Question in general, I mean, if anyone wants to answer it. So what do you think is the biggest obstacle for young adults coming out of college to either form or join a, a community and then more positively, how can we either empower them to overcome those obstacles or we ourselves overcome those obstacles? I'll just say that one of the things, and, uh, when I was in the hall at, at Notre Dame, we had a very, very uh, active, active hall life. And come the end of the time when they were graduating, they said, well, there's no parish now that will match this. I don't know where to go. How's it going to be? And I think that... Um, one of the obstacles that you'll face is that um, in many parishes, although everyone does say, I think across the board in general, people would say that you know, young adults are we- welcome. You're the hope of the future. But as you know, students say, you're the hope now. You're, you're right now. It's not the hope of the future. It's now. And a lot of times in some parishes, they, don't, they really don't welcome you now. Uh, for example, if it comes time for being on the parish council, even being an usher, being a Eucharistic minister, uh, there's sometimes not a great deal of excitement about having the young adults take those roles. They say, all are welcome, but you're really not. So you have to sort of overcome, and you push through on that. And you go, and I think that there's a couple of ways of doing it. I think it's always good to unite. You know, have a good number. Have some people around there, around you, your own age, that you want to go pursue these things. Also to go see the, the priest, who's the parish, the parish priest, and let him know how things really are. The other thing is, I think, that you, you, look and you look at the parish where you're living, and if you can't find it there, then you look around. I think in every, every diocese that I know of, there are places, and as a matter of fact, and I don't know how it is in Washington, but in, in, in Baltimore, probably at least, in all our parish, at least half the people come from outside the parish boundaries, if you will. That, those boundaries aren't as tight as they once were. So I, I, would, I would look around and pursue it. And when you find people that are enthusiastic, you know, you'll find wands in, the, in your group there, you'll, you'll, you'll move forward, and it'll be successful. I think, so. I think the other challenge is um, we're all together here in the room, but when you're moving between graduate school and the office and the community, it's harder sometimes to find people who are actively practicing their faith and, and to be able to ask them where they're going. And, and so I think it's, it's um, being able to find like-minded folks with whom you can share when you're brand new to a place. Bishop Madden, it was great to hear you talk about people in Baltimore trying to do things in the aftermath of the uh, Freddie Gray situation. Could you be a little more specific? You talked about focusing on health care and doing things in the community. Obviously, every, any of us who's had television saw the rioting that was going on and, and a lot of the destruction and the damage and, and those kinds of things, but we didn't hear much about the uh, after effects of anything that the Catholic Church had done. Yeah, one of the things they're trying to do is we looked at our own. We have a, an educational system in Baltimore, we have a hospital system, a Catholic educational system, Catholic uh, school system, and uh, Catholic hospitals and uh, Catholic charities. We have all these Catholic organizations all around the city. And what we found out that even within our own structure, that there's not a whole lot of cooperation. And that, uh, the, so we, the Archbishop was actually the one to put his finger on this. He said, why is it that if there's a child in school and that child's parents aren't employed, why can't Catholic Charities be more cooperative and work with the school? Or if there's another case where someone at home is, is ill, why can't our health care system really kick into you know, operation there instead of having people go all over the place looking for some kind of care? So we try to uh, get our own house in order before getting other houses in order. So we're trying to do that. So then from that we now have gone out on an ecumenical, interreligious level. And then from there, we've moved into the city and the state. So we're trying to go out, looking at our own needs for the correcting our own things that we need to get in order first, and then going out and working with others. And we're a long way off. We are not anywhere you know, in control of all of these things, or we haven't mastered all these things by any means. But one of the big things that you find out Following the riots, one of the things that impressed me was there's a church called St. Peter Claver. St. Peter Claver was located just about one block from the epicenter of the riots, which was Pennsylvania and North. And in the morning, or the next morning after the riots, 
the archbishop wanted to go around to different parishes in the area. And so I told the pastor that we would be there, say something about like 11 o'clock. I said, you know, we'll just we'll be stopping by and all that business. But then we decided we would go earlier. So we went there about 9 o'clock in the morning. And there was the pastor with about 100 people out clearing the streets. Clearing the streets. You know, the burnt out cars, all kinds of garbage all over the place, just clearing the streets. And I asked some people, they said, well, why are you doing this? And they say, well, we have NBC, ABC, CNN, everyone's over here. We don't want them and people across the country to think we live this way. This is the way we live. This is our neighborhood. This is our church. So we want to clean this up. And there, it was so beautiful because there was the, the pastor, the young adults from the pa- parish there, all cleaning up this, all working with the community together. So it was, it was a wonderful, wonderful example of, of people coming together in that particular time following the riots. Yes. Um, so we, we've heard a little bit about what parishes and intentional communities and various other things can do for young people, but I guess as a young person in a parish, what are there particular ways that young adults can serve that would be most useful? I, I guess, mm. you know, how can we help? Yeah, <laughs> that's a beautiful question. I think um, volunteering to lecture, volunteering to be a Eucharistic minister, volunteering to be an usher, because nothing brings more joy, right, to a lot of the seniors in the parish than seeing that the next generation is present and active in the church. So I think being full and active um, participants in parish life, I also know that our catechetical programs are always um, desperate for teachers and for assistant teachers. And a lot of parishes are getting much more creative in being able to build teams so that it's not a weekly commit- commitment you know, for nine months of the year, but maybe it's twice a month. And I think if, a, if four of you could get together and say, we would love to share this class, that, that would be marvelous, right? Not only for young people to see um, young adults actively engaged in the faith, but I think Bishop Matt and I um, would agree that w- we have a really tough go right now with the generation of parents who are not well catechized and maybe not prepared or always um, willing to serve in that role. So there's another place that we really need people. I think you come with so much great experience of service. And all those service hours that you had to do engaged you in the local community in a lot of ways. And so can you take one of those passions and bring it to the attention of parishes and kind of in this experience say, hey, what can we do to make a change in our local community and how can our parish be involved? Um, I would say that... um, there's no end of, oper- of things that parishes would love to get involved in, but we have a real challenge, given the busyness of everyone's lives, of people willing to um, make a commitment. And so to go to the pastor, rather than saying, Father, I think we should, what Father loves to hear is, I would love to help you <laughs> create this, this ministry or revive this ministry. And, and to begin small, I think Juan's story was so beautiful, right, of, that, of the organic way that it grew, and so just start small and see where the spirit moves. Do you have more to add to that one? Um, not going to add much, but I, I would just say, like, just know that other young people around you want this. You know, they do want it. They may not show it because, you know, you see them, oh, they show up for Sunday and then they leave. But just having, like, the, the courage that comes from God to, to kind of introduce yourself, meet other people, and just slowly kind of build those relationships and you'll find out that the number of young people who, who want to have more in the parish, it's, it's more than just youth. You know, it's, 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 so I, I would just say have, have that as an encouragement and, and yeah, it's, it's possible. I think one thing is, is to really, really, your strength, what is your strength? Your strength is, 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 is who you are. It's your enthusiasm. It's your excitement. It's, you know, when you, when you hear Juan talk about what he went through all the time, there's an enthusiasm there. Not someone telling a story, but he's telling you what his, his experiences have been. And I think that, you know, as, as young adults, when you go into a parish, when you go into a situation, you can look around and you can say, you know, there's some things going on here I'd like to be part of. And then you might also look around and say, you know, there are certain things that are really lacking in this place. Um, I remember going to one parish on a parish visitation and meeting with the parish council, and I asked, I said, well, why, why do you think people don't come here? And one of the parish council members said, well, who would come to this place? <laughs> who, who would want to come here? 
And when you were here, they said, what is this? You know, so I think that you can go in and look and see what, what the parish needs. Your real strength is your goodness, your enthusiasm, and your, your, the way you can size things up. And you know what a place needs. You don't have to wait and see if they have that or don't have it. Just, just put it out there and then follow. I think that's, that's your real gift to the parish. And as Susan said before, that the, um, going in and saying that we would like to do this, or we want to do that. that I think that's a wonderful way to do it. Um, hi. Um, I'm from a community that's really blessed with having a growing Newman community this last several years. And one problem I've noticed with our community, because a lot of people are starting to live together and have a Catholic household and everything, is what Juan mentioned was a lot of people living with good intentions versus being committed to living intentionally whether or not with prayer life or anything like that. So what would you recommend is a great way for people to start when they build households to be committed to living intentionally with Christ? Put it in paper. <laughs> no, it's, it's really, uh, we have a rule of life and uh, several pages long, but what was so beautiful and powerful about the rule of life is the fact that we met intentionally we're saying okay we're going to meet once a week to kind of figure out what's a, how do we want to live and kind of how will we agree to share prayer a prayer life a fraternal life or a service life in in, in this household environment and the the other thing is do it early cuz the, the the trap of good intentions is that in the beginning everybody has them and you think oh it's all going to be resolved and we're just going to figure things out on the way and and that rarely ever really works. You might get one group of people that works like that once in your lifetime, but very rarely does it work. So just start early and really take the time up front. It's going to be a sacrifice. You don't need to take a few hours every week to kind of meet through it, talk through it, what, what, what's important to us, what do we want to commit to, what does it mean to commit to this. So And it can be simple things like we have a once a week, um, we call it koinonia, which is a Greek word for fellowship community. So we have koinonia on Monday nights, and that's the night that we have it every Monday night, so we don't schedule anything. If, if I know something three months from now, it's going to be scheduled on Monday night, I know I'm not going to be available ordinarily, um, except if the Pope wants to meet me then. Maybe I'll, <laughs> I'll make a switch or something. But the fact that we, every Monday night we're available for one another just to have a time of prayer, we pray uh, vespers, and then we, we share a meal, and then we just have some time of play, recreation, before we all go to sleep. That is very simple. I mean, it's very simple. And prayer, and, and service life, you say you're part of a community? Is that something? Hmm? Okay. Yeah, and, and there's ways that you can figure out how can we make this household available to other people. And one thing is, of good for having in paper you also want to have practical stuff like how, how what does it mean to have the house clean who's going to take care of things because it's not nice to have people over when when you have you know three pairs of socks that don't match all over the floor <laughs> stuff like that so that's another um thing so it's ha- having to re- um work through what will keep this space a, a space of harmony it's very important and to continually pray to consecrate the space, the household to the Lord, knowing that we are going to be spiritually attacked. Animosity sometimes comes because there's, a, there's influence outside of us that don't want us to share life together and, and be a blessing to others. So continually to pray for that, that's very, very helpful. So, I think we have time for one more question. So whoever the lucky person is, perfect. I just wanted to say super quick, as a new convert myself, um, I don't want anyone to feel like they can't do anything. You know, don't feel like I work 50 hours a week, I don't have time, or I don't, you know, have a NASA income, (laughs) or don't, you know, just, just, it's okay, because, you know, as a new convert myself, you know, um, I probably couldn't name five books of the Bible as I stand here in front of all of you, and I admit that. (laughs) But it's okay, because, you know, just show your enthusiasm and show your excitement, because people will be like, I don't know what she had for breakfast, but I want that. (laughs) 
<laughs> so just kind of like get them all juiced up and get them in the door and push them off to them. <laughs> and like, okay, it's your job. <laughs> You're in. <laughs> so I just kind of wanted to, to say that um, I had the opportunity to uh, be a part of Christ's life here, and it is well worth me driving three hours just to be with them for one evening. It's worth the time. It's worth the gas. It's worth the the charge that it gives you. It's just, you know, um, so I just kind of wanted to share that, you know. Okay. Um, if we can just give a round of applause to Bishop and Dr. Timini and Juan. You can have last words, sure. Great. <laughs> that was a, a wonderful point, and you, know, you don't have to wait for things to be perfect because they're never going to be. <laughs> I mean, that's just the, the case. Just, just start now. But I, I just wanted to um, just make an offer you know, for those of you who are closer to Baltimore, or maybe not, maybe you're three hours away, you're welcome to visit Christ Life Young Adults. We, we have your open door, so feel free to come. If you're looking to experience what it means you wanted to see what it looks like to have like a, a vibrant young adult community, want to experience that life, maybe just to test it, or maybe you might want to come join us. Just feel free to visit us. Uh, we meet at the Shrine of St. Anthony every Wednesday night um, from 7 to 9, except the last Wednesday of the month. You could just Google Christ Life Young Adults. It will be the first thing that shows up. And, yeah, feel free to pay us a visit and, and show up and... See if there's something there for you. So I just wanted to extend the invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Juan.